Welcome in, everybody. I'm Reed Cowan. Our video feed's taking us to all things Donald Trump today. We're talking about the Republican National Convention in the wake of an assassination attempt, Donald Trump's pick for vice president coming in at any minute, and we'll take you to Florida, where Donald Trump just got a major win in court by a judge he appointed. This is CBS News 24-7. Let's go. Top, we want to take our video feeds live to Milwaukee and the Republican National Convention. Think about this. Thousands of delegates from all around the United States will be there to nominate former President Donald Trump during a roll call vote today at 3 p.m. Eastern for the Republican nomination. So we'll go live to, to the convention and their first session expected soon in this broadcast. But first, we want to take our video feeds to Florida. And there is something to talk about there. Judge Aileen Cannon just dismissed Donald Trump's classified documents case. The allegation there, Donald Trump kept classified documents and then worked to hold on to them after leaving the White House. And this just in, Donald Trump himself reacting to that very decision on social media this morning. He's calling for unity after the assassination attempt this weekend and for the dismissal of all of the criminal and civil cases against him those on the federal level, those in New York, and those in Georgia. He repeats past claims about the weaponization, he says, of the Department of Justice. CBS News campaign reporter and attorney Katrina Kaufman joins us live now. Okay, so this case not dismissed by Cannon based on the merits or the content of the case, but rather about Jack Smith being on the case in the first place. Walk us through that. Reed, good to be with you. Um, I think also you were mentioning the timing of this decision. I'm actually in Milwaukee now where the Republican National Convention starts today. Trump is about to pick his vice presidential nominee. We're on the heels of an attempted assassination. And now what was once thought to be the strongest case against him has been dismissed by Judge Cannon. And as you said, it is not on the merits of this case. It is on the basis that she says special counsel Jack Smith was unlawfully appointed appointed and unlawfully funded, violating the Constitution. She says that Attorney General Merrick Garland did not have the appropriate statutory authority from Congress to make the appointment in this way, which goes against rulings in the past by eight different federal judges who did find that attorney generals could appoint special counsels in this way and overturns precedent historically going all the way back to the Nixon era. All right, so we're already hearing the word appeal. How likely is it that an appeal will be launched? Who will launch it and when could we see it? I think it is very likely that we will see an appeal from special counsel Jack Smith related to this ruling, which dismisses his case. He may also be asking for the case to be reassigned to a different judge. Throughout this process, there have been a lot of questions about the handling of Judge Cannon of this case. We learned recently that when she was first assigned it, she was actually encouraged by two federal judges not to take the case in the first place due to her lack of trial experience. Experience and some favoritism that she had shown towards Donald Trump in the early days of this case. Um, another potential option here is that because of the way she dismissed the case, as you said, it's not on the merits, it's on the basis of special counsel Jack Smith, a U.S. attorney could potentially refile the case. So these are some of the options that are existing now for the Florida case against former President Donald Trump. All right, Katrina, always with great analysis and updates and punching more sky miles for us. Thank you so much for your live report. Hey, our video feeds showing Donald Trump just getting off his plane in Milwaukee. CBS News just confirmed Donald Trump will announce his choice for running mate. That will happen today. CBS's Natalie Brand joins us now live inside Fiserv Forum. Okay, so you are inside. You went through security. My first question for you, what was security like? Did it feel heightened to get in? Good to be with you, Reed. Security is understandably extremely uh, tight. It always is around this type of an event, but obviously uh, following Saturday's attempted assassination, uh, 
We're paying more attention to the security and different levels of it around this area. There is a security perimeter that extends several blocks around this arena. You have to go through various checkpoints. And in speaking to delegates and personnel here, they say they feel uh, pretty safe given what we are seeing in terms of the thousands of not only federal officers from, as you would expect, Secret Service, Service, Homeland Security to also local jurisdictions, including from California, right. who have flown in to assist with this event. This is considered the highest level security uh, event. Planning for it began more than a year ago. So yesterday, the special agent in charge here said that she was confident with the plans that have been put in place. But interestingly enough, a new statement today from the Secret Service director herself who said that this type of a plan is designed to be flexible. They will continue to monitor the intelligence and adapt as needed, Reed. Okay, and so let's talk about adapt as needed as far as the messaging goes. We've ha heard that Donald Trump has rewritten his address to delegates given what happened over the weekend. Any sign that we will hear, hear more of a tone of bring the nation together rather than fight, fight, fight? The tone certainly has changed. And again, in speaking to delegates, they note that. One delegate told CBS News uh, this is kind of now a, a, a taking on a somber tone. There's still a lot of excitement, though, and hope that this will uh, bring people together, leave folks more unified by the end of the week. One RNC volunteer said, you know, that when a, a national attack tragedy happens, like we saw on Saturday, uh, we see people coming together, and that's what we have seen from across both sides of the aisle. As you noted, the former president right. in two print interviews said that he has rewritten his convention speech that he's set to deliver on Thursday and will uh, try to call for unity. That's also a message we're hearing from President Biden in his public comments throughout the weekend. Okay, Natalie, Brad, and we know you'll pull those cables and we will feel them here at CBS News 24-7 the minute you hear about a vice presidential nominee pick. We appreciate you so much. Thank you very, very much. So as with every political convention, inside there are supporters and outside there are the expected detractors. These monitors here are showing protests outside the Milwaukee Convention Center with the largest demonstration planned for today. CBS News correspondent Roxana Saberi joins us live from Milwaukee and we are starting to see protests are they of one voice on one subject or is it a protest on many, many subjects? Reid, it's a protest on many, many subjects. They are calling for more LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, the end to the war in Gaza. But they do seem united in thinking that another Trump presidency would be a threat. Uh, one protester here telling us that the assassination attempt on the former president on Saturday was distracting people from what she considers the threat of another Trump presidency. And they are all also protesting against generally the Republican agenda, they say. There are about 2,000 people here so far. Organizers were spe expecting about 5,000. Uh, speeches have been, has started here about an hour, hour and a half ago. You can see some signs behind me. Stop Trump, racist Republicans, others call for peace in Palestine. Uh, a march is about to start here and probably in a few minutes. And uh, the protesters plan to rally through the streets, several blocks in downtown Milwaukee, getting very close to the perimeter of the Republican National Convention. All right, Roxana, thank you for that picture of some of the opposition outside. Thank you very much. So let's get back to that assassination attempt against Donald Trump, the former president, that happened over the weekend and shocked the world. As we speak, the two men shot during Saturday's rally are recovering in Pennsylvania hospitals. Marine veteran, 57-year-old David Dutch, and 74-year-old James Coppenhaver, both in stable condition as we speak. CBS News correspondent Meg Oliver is outside the hospital right now. She is at the ready to talk to us, and as soon as we can get her, we will speak to her within about a half hour. So let's talk about the man who died. He is retired fire chief, Corey Comparatori. Lost his life trying to shield his daughters from gunfire Saturday.
Today, this black cloth hangs around his fire station where he served his community. His friends say they want all of us in our country to see his life as a call for unity as they grieve his death. I want people to understand that he was a man of love and not hate, and that that's what we need to pursue right now. On social media, former President Donald Trump wrote, quote, we pray for the recovery of those who are wounded and hold in our hearts the memory of the citizen who was so horribly killed, close quote. Right now, we're learning from our crews and cameras in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, that people close to where the shooter lived are back in their houses after investigators in the hours that followed that assassination attempt swarmed the home and the shooter's car. We know that many of you have a lot of questions about this guy, the trigger man. So here's what we've been able to find out. 20 years old, Thomas Matthew Crooks fired an AR-style rifle seen right there on that roof. That rifle purchased legally by the shooter's father. We're also learning investigators found bomb materials in Crooks' home and vehicle. Joining us live now from Bethel Park is CBS News Pittsburgh, Megan Schiller. Megan, you are in that neighborhood, in the community. That's such a big heartbeat of this broadcast. What are people saying, the neighbors, to this? Yeah, it's really hard for these neighbors. They are not interested in all of this attention and very concerned with how this is painting Bethel Park and also Pittsburgh for the entire nation. New today, however, we are getting our first look at the home that Thomas Crooks lived at with his parents directly behind me. It is still blocked off by yellow police tape, but this is the home and the action and really the only action that has happened so far has been two investigators knocking on the door and being allowed in by someone inside. But all we could see from our vantage point directly across the street was essentially a hand, part of an arm. But if you do look in the driveway, that blue pickup truck is what neighbors say they regularly saw Thomas Crooks driving around the neighborhood. One neighbor who's directly across the street, whose yard I'm actually standing in, she said that every time Crooks got in that blue truck, and drove away, her dog lost her mind. That's how she said, you know, without a doubt, she knows that that is his pickup truck. So this home is still blocked off by the yellow tape. Only law enforcement can go in and out. The neighbors here, however, a lot of them tell me that they have gone to stay with friends and family out of Bethel Park, which is about 25 minutes south of, of the city of Pittsburgh or they're at hotels, essentially just trying to get out of Dodge because the entire area, all the streets are lined with vehicles, either from law enforcement or from the media. But I would say in terms of those who are from here, born and raised, the overall consensus is that they're upset about this. They're sick over what happened, no matter what their political party is, but they're very concerned with just what this says to the nation about Pittsburghers and about Bethel Park. And they just really want people to know that that he was an outlier and that that's not representative of this community. I got to ask, when I see that blue truck that you show us in the driveway, the neighbors say they often saw him drive. There are reports that explosives were found. Did anybody see anything in the days leading up to this? The neighbor whose yard I'm standing in right now, she said that honestly, a lot of her neighbors keep to themselves, including the family, the Crooks family. So she said that she didn't really have a lot of communication with them, even though her two children would ride the school bus with him every day. She said that nothing really kind of stood out, no red flags, so to speak. And a lot of these neighbors were shocked when they had a knock on the door in the middle of the night telling them that they needed to get out for a public safety emergency. They later were told by local law enforcement that it was for a potential bomb investigation. Mm. That was scary for them. They didn't get back into their house until around 11 o'clock last night. All right, reporting from our communities, we appreciate you so very much. Thank you for that update. We're also riding our video monitors to the White House as President Joe Biden added his voice calling for a review of security protocols after that deadly weekend at Donald Trump's rally. We'll go to that when we come back. You're watching CBS News 24-7. I'll see you just
happening right now. Our video monitors here behind me bringing us live pictures outside the venue where soon we will learn Donald Trump's pick for vice presidential nominee and hear from the former president on the mic for the first time since that assassination attempt designed to kill him. Let's jump the map, though, to our cameras and crews at the White House, where President Joe Biden is right now ordering an independent review of that assassination attempt. At the same time, President Biden is calling on our country to lower the temperature in our politics. Listen. Let's remember, here in America, our unity is the most elusive of goal goals right now. Nothing is more, more important for us now than standing together. We can do this. You know, from the beginning, our founders understood the power of passion. So they created a democracy that gave reason and balance a chance to prevail over brute force. That's the American we must be. An American democracy where arguments are made in good faith. An American democracy where the rule of law is respected. That address happening not many feet away from where we find CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes. She's joining us live now. Nancy, how does the Biden campaign do what they have to do, which is continuing on the campaign trail to make their message of differentiations to the United States to try to get the votes, while at the same time maintaining a respectful tone and, 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 and sound given what happened over the weekend? It is a tall order, Reed, and as you know, the campaign pulled down all of its advertising after that attempted assassination on Saturday. Now they say they are ready to slowly begin ramping up. They say, you know, they can't just uh, unilaterally disarm. This is a campaign. We are less than four months out from Election Day. They realize they need to start campaigning again. And so uh, they are going to put some ads back up on the air. Um, they are going to start responding to uh, President Trump, who, who's, uh, you know, reportedly going to announce his VP pick later today. I'm sure the Biden campaign will have something to say about that. And that that means that the president himself is going to be getting back out onto the campaign trail over the next couple of days after canceling an event in Austin, Texas today. All right. So tell us about the president's schedule in the coming week. And will he take the talking points from the stage at the RNC to sort of flip the narrative and continue that way? He very well may. He had a, a, a big briefing today in the Situation Room as facts continue to be gathered about uh, the, the shooting at that rally in, in Pennsylvania. Then later today, he's heading to Las Vegas. Nevada, of course, is a battleground state. He's going to be speaking at an NAACP conference there tomorrow. He's also going to be taping an interview with our sister station, BET. So it'll be interesting uh, to see what he says to them. Uh, and then the next day, he does actually have a, a campaign event in earnest. He's also going to be speaking to a Hispanic Civil Rights Convention. And so he does have a packed schedule. And then beyond that, the entire campaign apparatus is focused on what's coming out from the RNC this week. And, and as, as, as you noted, they're going to try to adjust their tone based on what they're getting from Milwaukee. All right. Fascinating times. Nancy Cordes, thank you so much for that live report. Hey, we're back in just a moment. All eyes on Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. And the big question, who will Donald Trump, tr Trump choose as his running mate? We're back in a minute. Happening right now, we have our cameras fired up there. You see Phi serve form in Milwaukee. That is where delegates from all of the United States at 3 p.m. Eastern will cast their ballots to make what is presumptive nominee Trump their official nominee for the presidency. We will bring that to you here on CBS 24-7 when that happens. We also have our cameras, though, fired up in Texas, where Governor Greg Abbott is boots on the ground. Pretty soon, he's going to be talking from that podium there to first responders who have been so crucial 24-7, 365, helping people in the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel. He'll also get a briefing going with a news conference on the ongoing recovery efforts. And that's important because so many people are living without electricity. All of this playing out while hundreds of thousands of Texans are in the dark right now. More than a week after Hurricane Barrel tore through Houston, no power and no AC means scorching heat and it's dangerous. In fact, some restaurant owners are losing thousands of dollars in perishable food because they don't have anything plugged in that works. It does make me more than just nervous. I have to be prepared for whatever happened next. It's very, very strange. You know, we, 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 we work every day. We don't have any days off. 
It's very strange. I hope it's going to be better. Yeah. We'll look forward to that. So that's the situation in Texas in the aftermath of Barrow. But Zoe, we understand in the Northeast, it is just downright hot and dangerous for that reason. Oh, yeah. Many places across the Northeastern parts of the United States going to be dealing with their hottest weather so far this year. So let's take a look at that because it's not just the heat. It's also the humidity that they're going to be having to deal with. So heat and humidity across the East Coast of the United States is where all eyes are on. Right now, we're expecting high temperatures in places like Washington, D.C. to get up to 99 to potentially even the triple digits. And that's just our temperatures. Heat indices are likely going to be up to 110 degrees. So it is hot, it is a humid, and it is going to make for oppressive conditions both today and into tomorrow across the Northeast. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at our heat illness risk because it is pretty high across the eastern parts of the United States, especially if you head down the east coast over North, North Carolina, South Carolina, the places in red and purple. This is going to be our biggest issue when it comes to that heat. All things to keep our eyes on today and into tomorrow. You notice, though, that the line of heat continues to push further south and further east. That's because a cold front will be heading our way, and that will cool things down across the east into Wednesday. But today and tomorrow, we do have widespread severe chances for heat-related illness. That's something to keep your eye on with widespread excessive heat warnings, heat advisories, in effect, all across the east coast today and into tomorrow. Again, heat-related illness is going to be our biggest issue. Make sure you drink a lot of water, even when you're not thirsty, don't forget the sunscreen and honestly to stay inside if you can. It's the humidity that really gets you this time of year. But I have some good news, Reed. They are going to be looking at an end in sight. That cold front that's going to bring some severe weather to the Midwest should cool down the East Coast. So there is good news on the way. But today, tomorrow, you got to practice the heat safety. We'll listen for that collective. Ah, oh, finally. Nice. Okay, Zoe, thank you. Hey, when we come back, we're going to have a conversation live outside the hospital where two people who were injured during the assassination attempt on Donald Trump are recovering. CBS News 24 7 streaming coast to coast and worldwide. Back in just a few minutes. All right, welcome back. We are following those major developments out of Florida where Donald Trump appointed Judge Elaine Cannon just dismissed the classified documents case against the former president. The judge finding that the appointment of special counsel Jack Smith in this case was unconstitutional. Donald Trump faced 40 charges stemming from his handling of documents marked classified after leaving office and allegedly obstructing the investigation of the Department of Justice. And also this just in, we're getting his reaction to that decision on social media, calling for unity after the assassination attempt this weekend and then talking about the cases. He is calling for the dismissal of all of the criminal and civil cases against him on the federal level and in New York and in Georgia, repeating past claims, he says the DOJ has been weaponized against him. Hey, our video feeds now take you live to Milwaukee and the Republican National Convention, where thousands of delegates from all over the country are there to nominate former President Donald Trump during a roll call vote today at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll go live to the convention's first session, expected soon in this broadcast. As soon as that happens, we'll show it to you. But also our video feed showing Donald Trump getting off of his plane in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In fact, CBS News just confirmed Trump will announce his choice for running mate today. That's what I want to talk about with CBS's Natalie Brand. She's now live inside Pfizer Forum. So let's jump a little deeper into some of the names that are in play. We've heard Florida Senator Marco Rubio, but also there is another big Midwestern name that is thought to be a heavy hitter in the choice pool as well. That's right, Reed, and that's Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. We've had one of our great uh, embeds following him around Ohio this weekend or staked out outside of his home. And Shauna Mizell notes that there have been government vehicles parked outside of his home, increased security, especially in light of uh, Saturday's attempted assassination of Donald Trump. And so the rumors around Senator Vance have kind of ramped up, but really 
who former President Donald Trump picks remains a mystery. He described in one interview uh, earlier that this is kind of a sophisticated version of The Apprentice. So there's so much suspense that the campaign is trying to build around uh, this VP pick. And of course, the thousands of delegates who are here are eager to find out who that person will be. Let's talk about those thousands of delegates behind you because we can see what looks to be a musical act right now performing. Typically, these conventions are celebratory and yes. sometimes they can be just downright crazy. What is the mood like given what just happened to their presumptive nominee over the weekend? I can tell you, Reed, there appears to be a lot more excitement today. This is the day when the convention is kicking off. The delegates are really gathering inside. Yesterday, the mood was more reflective. One delegate described it as somber. Uh, others I spoke to, they said, while well, this event is moving forward, and that's important to show that they will be undeterred by Saturday's events, at the same time, there's more reflection here. And they're hoping to see uh, people come together, a tone of unity. That's also something that the former president has said in recent print interviews, that he's actually rewritten his convention speech and will call for unity uh, in his major speech that he gives here on Thursday. But as you can note, the music is going. We are just a short time from this officially kicking off with that iconic roll call vote where you see delegates from all the states standing up and a officially nominating former President Trump to be this year's GOP nominee. That's a very exciting moment. So you can definitely feel that in the air here, even though there's no question, given what happened this weekend, that the mood has changed. Natalie Brand, thank you so much for your report from inside convention headquarters on the stream. Always a joy having you. And you know, as with every political convention inside, there are always detractors outside. In fact, our monitors right now showing protests outside that Milwaukee Convention Center right now in real time. The largest demonstration is planned for today. And CBS News correspondent Roxana Saberi joins us live from outside that form. A much different scene there on the inside supporters, on the outside people who want anybody but Donald Trump to be president again. agenda, they say, and there are many protesters here who have voiced concern about another Trump presidency. Now, organizers have not formally endorsed a candidacy, a candidate, but we have talked to protesters here who say they're concerned, that especially in the wake of that assassination attempt on the former president, that people are distracted and they won't, they won't realize how much of what they say is a threat that President Trump, that the former president can pose if he were in the White House again. Thank you so much for that report. CBS News 24-7 streaming coast to coast and worldwide inside and outside and offering us two very pictures of these United States right now. And you know, as much as we want to know more about the shooter who attempted to take Donald Trump's life and his motive, it's going to take a lot of time to put those pieces together. In fact, we're learning neighbors that live close to where the shooter live are back in their homes after investigators swarmed the home, even went through the car with a fine tooth comb. So here's what we know so far. That shooter identified as 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks. He fired an AR rifle. His father legally purchased that firearm. And investigators say they also found bomb materials inside his home and inside his vehicle. Unfortunately, the attempted assassination that wounded former President Donald Trump did not end there. A Pennsylvania firefighter and a servant of his community is dead and more rally goers critically wounded. 
CBS News correspondent Meg Oliver joins us live outside the hospital in Pittsburgh. Meg, what is the latest on the investigation and also any update on the people who are still wounded there today? Yeah, Reed, the very latest in terms of the investigation, we know that the shooter bought a box of ammunition with 50 rounds the morning of the assassination attempt on the former president. We also know that that AR-style rifle that you just mentioned that he used was purchased well before the attack by his father. That was not a new purchase. We also know that the FBI believes he acted alone. He was not on the Bureau's radar, but we still do not know a motive. So still a lot of unanswered questions remain to be seen. As far as the victims, there are still two that remain in critical but stable condition here at Allegheny General Hospital. They are 57-year-old David Dutch, a former Marine Corporal who served two deployments, and 74-year-old James Copenhaver. As far as the third victim, 50-year-old Corey Comparatory, witnesses say he died trying to shield his family at the rally from gunfire. He was a veteran firefighter with the Buffalo Township Fire Department. He started there in 19 1994. We visited them yesterday, and everybody is absolutely heartbroken. They describe him as a family man, somebody who loved God, and somebody who would take his shirt off for anybody walking down the street. He was just a great guy, and he's so missed in that community. He was married and with his wife, Helen, for 34 years. He had two daughters. They paid beautiful tributes to him online yesterday. Um, at one point, his wife calling her husband the hero. He died the hero he always was, and his daughter calling him a real-life action hero. As I mentioned, he was a longtime firefighter. He retired just a few years ago after being chief, and his gear was still hanging in his locker yesterday when we were there. A running joke around the fire department is that his last name is pretty hard to say, Reed, um, comparatory, and it's pretty long. And on the back of his, his jacket, they told him, you're going to have to lose one of those vowels to fit it on there. So they were trying to find a little, just a bittersweet humor there as they were looking at that. They raised it up on top of the fire department yesterday as the American flag was flying at half staff. Well, and as we see what plays out in Milwaukee, no doubt those three names that you just said will be echoed. You know, a firefighter, a veteran of our armed forces, and a senior citizen in our nation killed or injured. And you can see why the calls for all of us to do better. Thank you so much for that update right outside the hospital, Meg. We appreciate you. All right, when we come back, we are going to be gauging the international reaction. Hey, on the stream, we're not only talking to our audiences in the United States, but also all over the world. We're we'll back in just a minute. Welcome back, everybody. CBS News 24-7 streaming live coast to coast and worldwide. And right now, you are looking at what is going to be a very busy and very important place over the next several hours. We're talking about Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the Republican National Convention. That live camera there focused on where some major business in the United States is about to take place. State delegates about to gavel in and begin the first session of that convention speaker set. Later this afternoon, of course, the delegates will stand and the roll call will happen and we will begin to see state by state those delegates uh, def definitely making their move in uh, making presumptive nominee Donald Trump the official nominee, the Republican nominee for the presidency. And, you know, we are seeing reaction from around the world on the shooting over the weekend, that assassination attempt that so many people there in Milwaukee on that floor will be talking about. Here's Ian Lee with that. Take a look at what happened. Oh. The attempt on former <laughs> President Donald Trump's life shocked the world. Well, Donald Trump has survived. The shooting quickly made headlines and drew reactions. Buckingham Palace announced Britain's King Charles sent Trump a private message, while UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer spoke with him over the weekend. The condemnation of political violence was unanimous. It was an attack on democracy. It was an attack on all the democracies. Donald Trump. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said the appalling crime shows how serious the challenges to democracy are right now. 
On social media, many allies sent their best wishes for a speedy recovery, including leaders of France, Canada, and Japan. Around the world, politicians have increasingly found themselves under threat. A gunman killed a former Japanese prime minister in 2022. Ukraine says Zelensky has survived several Russian assassination attempts. Then last May, the Slovak prime minister survived being shot several times. Even America's foes denounced the shooting, but took a swipe at U.S. politics. A Russian government spokesman blamed the Biden administration for creating an atmosphere that provoked the attack, while Chinese state media said it's evidence of the toxic political divisions in the United States. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. We also have our cameras fired up in Texas, where Governor Greg Abbott is boots on the ground to first responders who've been so crucial following Hurricane Barrel. He'll also, while he's out and about, get a briefing and give a news conference on what is going to be a long series of weeks of ongoing recovery efforts. You know, a week after Hurricane Barrel tore through Houston, hundreds of thousands of Texans at this very moment, they're in the dark, no electricity, and that's leaving a lot of neighbors and businesses stuck contending with scorching heat and a lot of uncertainty as to when the lights will come back on. Cleanup is also underway in Tucson, Arizona right now. We've got this video from overnight where a powerful storm battered residents, brought down trees. Some of them even struck vehicles, took down power lines. In fact, last night, more than 20,000 people were without electricity. And the Tucson Fire Department responded to at least 50 calls for down power lines. Zoe, Mother Nature, meaning business, you're, you also have word of some severe storms out in the Midwest. Yeah, I was about to say, Arizona's not the only one dealing with that severe weather threat with heavy rainfall and even tornadoes potentially heading towards the Midwest. So let's take a closer look at that because, again, we are expecting a line of showers and thunderstorms to develop across the eastern parts of the United States, but you can kind of see it making its way over the Great Lakes communities.